by National Economic Advisor Laura Tyson. And later at 2.20, a speech by author Hazel Henderson on the environment and the economy. Now the report of the investigation of White House access to FBI files. Today, Republican Congressman William Klinger chaired this one-hour hearing, where members edited the interim report of the committee. Today, a government reform and oversight will resume sitting, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois, the ranking member, Mrs. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last week, we discussed the required reports to be, ready, to be read by the clerk to make a procedural point. Although we've just a few minutes ago agreed to consider this and other reports before us today to be considered as read, perhaps this report should have been read to make a substantive point, namely that I doubt any members have had an opportunity to read it. It was delivered to us after the last vote of last week, so I doubt anyone would know what's in it. Even if we had an opportunity to read it, there's no way to know whether its findings are accurate. This report is not based upon any particular hearings. There was no effort to include the minority in the drafting. Uh, the report appears to be an effort to discredit the administration's claims of success in its national performance review. While I have no problems with an objective examination of these management efforts, I am sure that the staffer who wrote this report worked hard on it. However, it makes no sense to ask members to vote on a report when they have had no opportunity at hearings to judge the veracity of the claims. Mr. Chairman, a wiser approach might have been a request to an, uh, to an independent organization such as GAO to review both this report and the administration's reports to determine the success of the Clinton administration's efforts to reinvent government. That could prove to be effective oversight. On the other hand, bringing this report to a vote with no opportunity to assess its contents amount to just one more committee contribution to the Dole campaign. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlelady for her comments. I would note for the record that this is uh, in, uh, in keeping in a tradition which was established at the end of the last Congress where Chairman Conyers issued a report and unlike this report, he issued it as a chairman's report without bringing it to the committee for consideration. Well, Mr. Chairman, is this a chairman's report or is it supposed to be a committee report? It is going to be a committee report. That is going to be the difference. Well, that We're is a major difference and we therefore will have this we should discussed. have had some hearings on this report so that everybody would know what's in it. I would uh, tell the gentlelady that in fact there are a number of hearings uh, were held on matters within this report, all of which are cited carefully in the report. But Mr. And Chairman, we haven't had any hearings on this report. This particular report, I would that we want to report out of here today. I remind the gentlelady that the report that Mr. Conyers issued, nobody saw before it was uh, laid Mr. before Chairman, the American people. And, about this, Mr. Conyers, we're talking and this report about is now before every member of the committee and has been with them for, for three days. Mr. Chairman, we're talking about the, the chairman of this committee, who is Bill Klinger, and I am the, rec uh, the ranking member of this committee, who is Curtis Collins. We're not talking about the past, we're talking about the present. Uh, does any... Other members seek recognition to speak for or against the report. Uh, we do not at the present have a quorum present. Um, the um, we will defer action on this uh, on a vote on this matter until we have uh, achieved a quorum, and uh, we will we will call up the next report. Investigation. investigation into the White House and Department of Justice on security of FBI background investigation files. Kevin. All right. Uh, the, um, the report deals with the Filegate interim report. The chair recognizes himself. Uh, since May 1930, May 30th, 1996, this committee has conducted an investigation into the actions of the White House and the FBI concerning the White House's improper acquisition of hundreds of FBI background investigation files of former Republican officials. The committee first learned of the FBI files problem in the course of the Travelgate investigation. The revelation of this gross impropriety originated from the committee's January 11, 1996 subpoena 
to the White House which requested all documents related to Mr. Billy Ray Dale. Throughout the spring of this year, the White House withheld Billy Dale's FBI file and more than withheld it, they mischaracterized it to the committee as a, quote, personnel file. At no time throughout the spring of 1996 and into the summer of 1996 did the White House ever acknowledge that Billy Ray Dale's FBI file was in its possession and had been ordered seven months after Mr. Dale was fired along with his six colleagues. The counsel's office made extraordinary efforts, including having the president claim executive privilege over Billy, Billy Dale's FBI file to keep it from disclosure to this committee. It was not until the morning of a scheduled floor vote on contempt that the White House finally produced this file. Why did it take the extraordinary threat of jailing the White House counsel to, to produce Billy Ray Dale's file? In fact, when Mr. Dale's file was finally forwarded to the committee, the file was not even then distinctly identified in a production log and was just grouped among other documents emanating from the counsel's office. Personnel records are distinctly different from FBI background reports and are kept in separate and distinct offices at the White House. The committee was particularly troubled about the White House obtaining Billy Dale's FBI file because of the history that the White House had in vainly trying to build a case against Mr. Dale. White House officials had reviewed Dale's personnel file as well as the personnel files of the six other travel office employees. The fact that the White House misrepresented to the committee that it had this document raised, I think, very legitimate concerns about why this document had so long been wrongfully retained. When the committee learned that Mr. Dale's file was part of a larger acquisition of files, additional concerns arose. Since early in June, when we first learned of this matter, the committee has attempted to determine what led to the appalling breakdown in existing procedures which enabled the White House to obtain possession of hundreds of inappropriately requested FBI files. When the FBI director investigated the matter, he concluded that these actions constituted egregious, quoting, egregious violations of privacy, close quote, and worked with the White House to make needed changes in the process, which I am advised are now in place. As the committee interim report, interim report makes clear, we have yet to determine whether the improper acquisition of hundreds of FBI background files was due to incompetence, as the White House claims, or if darker motives were involved. Furthermore, even if the initial actions were due to incompetence, the result was that political operatives of highly dubious reputations had access to these very sensitive files. As Meg Greenfield pointed out in the Washington Post in June of this year, even if the accident rationale holds up, it was a plenty serious and inexcusable accident. Neither that material nor that responsibility should ever have been placed in those hands. Whether or not these events are shown to be a blunder due to the incompetence of the inappropriately placed Greg Livingstone and his political sidekick Anthony Marcisa, or whether the duo was engaged in other activities, we learned that the Clinton White House treated these and other security matters in a cavalier fashion. The FBI and Secret Service raised red flags about the background of Greg Livingstone. The Secret Service also had concerns about Livingstone's supervisor, Bill Kennedy, Young, inexperienced staff were placed in the office along with Mr. Marcisa, who was specifically requested for a detail by Mr. Kennedy at, Mr. at Livingstone's request. There was no doubt that Livingstone was an inappropriate choice to head this office, yet there was some still unidentified source of support to keep Livingstone in this position for over three years. Who hired Craig Livingstone? And why is that still still, after all this time, an unanswered question. In the course of this investigation, the White House refused to fire Livingstone, and he was only relieved of his duties when he made the request himself. Subsequently, he resigned while testifying before this committee. Mr. Livingstone should never have been in charge of this office, and those who continued to retain him bear equal responsibilities for the actions that he took. Under Livingstone's tenure as director of the security office, the office had teenage interns without clearances with access to the most sensitive files of hundreds of officials. There was a huge backlog of individuals who did not obtain White House passes and clearances in a timely fashion. And according to Livingstone's assistant, Lisa Wetzel, there were even 
missing files during this, his tenure. In short, no one was minding the store, no small comfort to anyone who had an FBI background file in that office, regardless of what their political affiliation might be and regardless of how the files came to be in that office. In the course of this investigation, we also learned about troublesome actions taken by the FBI General Counsel Howard Shapiro, which indicate a potentially compromising relationship between the FBI General Counsel and the White House Counsel's office. Mr. Shapiro not only gave a heads up to the White House about an FBI interview of Bernard Nussbaum, about Craig Livingstone, but Mr. Shapiro also had provided a preview copy of retired FBI agent Gary Aldrich's book to the White House four months before it was published. When Director Free assumed his position, he claimed to have told President Clinton that, quote, the FBI must maintain its independence and have no, no role in politics. Mr. Shapiro provides no credible appearance of independence, and his resignation is necessary to begin to restore the trust in this office and to meet Director Free's own commitment. The committee's investigation has sufficient information to realize the great danger in the White House's unauthorized acquisition of these sensitive FBI files. We know the files were in the hands of political operatives, non-professionals, volunteers, teenagers in proximity to a copier, and individuals without security clearances. We know there was virtually no supervision over this extraordinarily sensitive process. We know that Anthony Marcisa took some sensitive data from the White House. We know that Lisa Wetzel reported to the White House that there were missing files in the course of Livingstone's tenure. Regardless of the outcome and the reasons for how the inappropriate acquisition occurred, it is clear that White House security process was a process out of control. It is of no small comfort that now the White House has put in charge of this process the very individual who approved Craig Livingstone's security clearance without reviewing Livingstone's FBI background file, was told, in fact, to not be concerned about that. Mr. Livingstone's successor, Mr. Charles Easley, testified before this committee that he signed Livingstone's clearance without reviewing Livingstone's FBI file, the only case that he did so at the White House. Therefore, the question still remains, who is Craig Livingstone, and why did everyone in the White House provide him with such special treatment, and why was he in charge of this sensitive job at the White House? Did the inappropriately placed staff take any inappropriate actions as a result of the access they enjoyed? Those and other questions still remain to be answered and are part of a continuing investigation by the Independent Council and by this committee. The Chair would now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You and I have certainly had our differences beginning on the first day of this committee when it met to organize and mark up the unfunded mandates bill. But even though we have often disagreed, we've never been disagreeable. We've always been able to talk about our differences and understand where each side is coming from. That is one of the reasons I was saddened to learn of the procedural battles that broke out in our markup last week on the travel office report. As I understand it, because I wasn't here, I was in the hospital, the battle erupted not because we on this side of the aisle disagreed with the substance of the report, which we did, but because you sought to ban our right to debate the report. Efforts to save time by stifling debate will always end up taking much more time in the long run. We Democrats are not afraid to debate the issues, and we do not walk out of committee hearings or markups whenever we do not agree with you. If that were the case, we'd be gone much of the time. We've only walked out when our constituents have been denied the right to have their elected representatives in this body speak on their behalf. Mr. Chairman, the reports before us this evening will soon be forgotten. But I fear that the ending of bipartisan cooperation on investigations will never be. This report on the FBI files and those regarding the travel office in Waco are three of the most blatantly partisan reports I've ever seen. These investigations were conducted in a partisan manner, and for the first time in my memory, in the case of the latter two, subpoenas were issued without a committee vote or consultation, much less agreement from the minority. Perhaps you may think it's a lot easier to ignore the minority, haul in the witnesses you want for depositions, disregard their testimony, and write whatever report you want. But in the end, it's self-defeating because what you end up with are reports that have no credibility and are nothing more than election year Republican political rhetoric, which the American people will recognize. Now let me. 
He first discovered that several hundred files of former administration employees had been improperly requested by the White House Office of Personnel Security, I was quick to announce my support for a full investigation. All of us agree that it was wrong to request these files and that an investigation was warranted to answer two obvious questions that all Americans had. One, why the files were requested, and two, how they were used. There obviously is a big difference between the files being requested by mistake or being requested as part of a sinister White House plot to get dirt on the political opposition. If the information was then used to smear political opponents, it would have been even worse. Having sat through all of the hearings and reviewed the thousands of documents provided by the White House and the transcripts of the depositions, here is what I think the report should have said. It should have said that the committee has found no evidence that the FBI files were requested as part of a political plot by the White House. There is no evidence that anyone made such a direction, nor is there any ev evidence that anyone higher than Craig Livingstone even knew that the files had been improperly requested. There was no evidence that confidential information was spread to White House officials for improper use. It appears that the files were requested by Anthony Marcisa. While there may continue to be some uncertainty about how he came upon the list of names he requested, one plausible theory is that they came from an outdated list. Now, that's not so hard to say. It hasn't been hard for newspapers and others covering this investigation to say that. It's a kind of straightforward finding that the American public wants to know. Instead, let me read from the report, which was written by the majority staff with no effort to seek the input of the minority. After noting that the White House had improperly requested the files, the report states, and I quote, this leads to the possibility that the Clinton administration was attempting to prepare a political hit list or enemies list with the most sensitive private information possible, end quote. In other words, although the committee found absolutely no evidence that anyone was told to create an enemies list, the majority wants to continue to raise the question. Now this is just one of hundreds of examples of the partisan political bias in this particular report. This entire investigation could be summarized as a series of unfounded accusations followed by silence when the allegation proves false. It began when you accused ex-White House counsel Bernard Nussbaum of being responsible for requesting Billy Dale's file months before he had left the White House. At a press conference, you stated, and I quote, at the very least, there is a strong impl imp imp implication that President Clinton's counsel acted unethically in requesting confidential background checks of a former employee, end quote. When you subsequently learned that Mr. Nussbaum's name was typed on the request, as had been the practice for 30 years, and that he had no knowledge of the request, there was never an apology or a correction. The same occurred when you implied that George Stephanopoulos had some close relationship with Craig Livingstone because Livingstone had written to him for a job request. You never mentioned that Mr. Stephanopoulos instructed his secretary to take no action on Mr. Livingstone's request. It happened again when you went to the White House floor to imply that the First Lady, Bernard Musbaum, Craig Livingstone and others were all lying when they denied knowing of any relationship between the First Lady and Livingstone's mother, and you based all allegations on a note by FBI agent Dennis Scalabrini. So rather than investigating this allegation, such as simply picking up a phone and calling Mrs. Livingstone, you went straight to the press, the American public, and the independent counsel. At no time did you mention that agent Scalabrini's credibility had been challenged by another agent in a memo the committee had. And that memo claimed that Agent Scalabrini had a strong dislike for the Clintons and a close relationship with Billy Dale. As the investigation of the FBI fails, failed to find any grand conspiracy to get dirt on former White House officials, I watched with fascination as you kept trying to steer in different directions to keep the allegation alive. I've already uh, mentioned the ridiculous detour about Gray Livingstone's mother. I could also add others, such as problems with White House passes in 1993, which was an old issue that was already fully investigated. Then you moved on to, to uh, drug use in the White House, and even spent several pages in the report on a section entitled, quote, Craig's Quest for the Military Office, end quote. Now I assume the use of this term, Craig, is meant to be derogatory, but beyond that, I can't see how his failed attempt to get a promotion is of any interest to this committee. 
Clearly, this report is yet another example of why it has been said during the presidential campaign that the Republicans are building a bridge to the past, while the Democrats are building a bridge to the future. When the news of the FBI files came, all the Republicans wanted to do was look at the past in hopes of embarrassing the Clinton administration. We Democrats wanted to look at what went wrong and then fix it. Along with many of my Democratic colleagues, I introduced H.R. 3785, which would require that the White House seek the consent of any individual before requesting the FBI file. This would end this absurd practice of allowing presidents to take these confidential files to their libraries when they leave office. And although we are called the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, we never even held a hearing on my bill. That was a clear indication to me that you weren't interested in anything but a partisan smear campaign. Let me turn briefly to one of the individuals smeared in this FBI report, FBI General Counsel Howard Shapiro. He became the whipping boy in this report because he told the White House about the noted Livingstone's file that Bernard Musbaum alleged a connection between the, white, uh, the First Lady and the Livingston's mother. Let me be honest, Mr. Chairman. You were not upset because the White House learned of this note because you fully intended to make it public. You were upset that they had an opportunity to investigate its validity and issue statements from the involved parties denying its truthfulness. Mr. Livingstone's FBI file was prepared for the White House. Under procedures in all administrations, the White House will have been given any derogatory information contained in the FBI investigation. Certainly there was nothing improper about the White House receiving this information. In short, Mr. Shapiro got caught in a political crossfire, and this, of course, is perhaps your way of striking back. In conclusion, I regret that I cannot support this report because I believe that we could have produced a bipartisan report that would have been honest and thorough. It would have pointed out the failings of the Office of Personnel Security, but would not have engaged in unfortunate partisan political rhetoric. Mr. Chairman, at the conclusion of this markup, I would like to have a few brief closing remarks and yield back. Uh, thank you, gentlelady. I think we will now return. I note the presence of a quorum. And before we continue with the debate on the uh, file gate uh, issue, uh, we'll consider the, the uh, vote on the management report. All those in favor of that report signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And the uh, management report is referred, is, uh, is approved and will be reported to the full house. Mm -hmm. And now, the, uh, does anybody else seek recognition on this report? The gentleman from California. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. The uh, White House staff's improper requests for the FBI background files remain a shocking and appalling violation of the rights of everyday Americans. It is appalling to hear the claim that everything's okay and the investigation conducted by this committee and the hearings on this topic were really unnecessary because it was just a snafu. I do not consider incompetence an acceptable explanation for what we've seen in this situation. The White House's egregious violations of privacy, together with the FBI's failure to protect its files, is a shocking revelation. Even more shocking are the continuing claims by some that this committee's investigation was unnecessary. The evidence is very clear. Were it not for the efforts of Chairman Klinger, the FBI file scandal would have remained buried in boxes marked for the William Jefferson Clinton Presidential Library. I commend Chairman Klinner for unrelenting but fair investigation. His instincts were correct in the spring of 1993 when he saw something wrong with how the travel office employees were fired. Despite being stiffed by many on Capitol Hill in the majority at that time, he continued his search for the truth, uh, truth and when we achieved the, the majority, uh, he was able to go at it with the power the majority has for good or ill. And the stonewalling from the White House, which was persistent, the unfair charges of partisanship from some of his colleagues in this House. Thanks to his persistence, Billy Dale, the other victims of those notorious and clandestine affairs, have been given the chance to tell their side of the story. The President and his staff have still not apologized for the mistakes they made with the travel office staff. 
and the persecution of person and reputation that was involved in those sordid firings in the travel office where you're taken off the grounds flat in the back of an uncarpeted station wagon. Mrs. Morella has been quite eloquent on the subject of how civil servants were treated by that administration. For those of us appalled by the treatment of the travel office's hardworking and loyal staff, the revelations covered by this report are even more shocking. It was not a snafu as the White House staff and their defenders so persistently insist. Rather, as the FBI has concluded, it was, quote, an egregious violation of privacy, unquote. And that pri violation of privacy was against hundreds of citizens. To this day, questions persist. Who typed up the list of requested files? Why were two seasoned political campaign operatives put in charge of the sensitive personnel files? Who hired Mr. Livingstone? Maybe Stanley in darkest Africa hired Mr. Livingstone. Uh, and why was he put in such a sensitive position with so little oversight? Who else read and or copied the files while they were in the White House vaults? When the White House staff realized that it should not have the files, why were the files not returned to the FBI? The answers to all of these questions remain elusive, and that's why this is only an interim report. There are those critics who claim this investigation has gone far enough. They say that admitting incompetence and removing two low-level employees is enough reaction. Well, there are more than 400 people out there down through the G's whose rights were violated and whose privacy was trampled upon. Where's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey might ask? I believe the administration owes the 400 and the American people the answers to these lingering questions. Where are the files beyond the G's? Is it several thousand? Where have they been hidden? What's missing? would be certainly the first question. Again, I applaud Chairman Klinger for attempting to find these answers. The American public should know how their government functions and how it misfunctions. And this is a case of severe misfunction. Therefore, I support the interim report as a step toward getting those answers. Thank the gentleman for his comments. And uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, once again, we have a report written exclusively by the Republican majority and leaked to the press before it was given to the members of the committee. Once again, the Republican majority has sacrificed objectivity and fairness to partisanship and political expediency. I have reached the regrettable conclusion that in this Congress, the rules and traditions are followed only when they serve the convenience of the Republican majority. The public has a right to know why the White House Office of Personnel Security inappropriately requested FBI background files on previous administration employees. It was a serious breach of privacy. We all agree that Craig Livingstone did not have the appropriate background for his position. We agree that the new employees in the White House Office of Personnel Security should have been better trained. We agree that the FBI background files should have been treated with proper care. And we support the procedures that the FBI and the White House have put into place to ensure that this does not occur again. We also know, however, that no evidence exists that anyone in the White House intended to misuse this information or that it was misused. Unfortunately, the committee has turned this investigation into a familiar pattern. It has made one accusation after another against the admin administration. These accusations create headlines, and when they are found to be completely uh, without substance, the committee moves on to another subject. Before the investigation of the FBI files even began, the committee accused the White House of having an enemies list. <laughs> That accusation proved to be a figment of the committee's imagination. The committee all but ignored the testimony of individuals whose information contradicted its preordained conclusion. By the time that accusation was discredited, the committee, however, simply forgot about it and moved on to another one. Chairman Klinger held a press conference to announce that former White House counsel Bernard Nussbaum had personally and illegally 
ordered hundreds of F FBI background files on Republicans. The basis for this untrue allegation was a pre-printed request form that had been used by every White House since Lyndon Johnson. This spectacle could have been avoided if the committee staff had conducted the most elementary inquiry. Finding the truth, however, was not their goal. The com committee simply moved on to another unfounded accusation. This time it accused Craig Livingston of getting his job through the First Lady, who supposedly was friends with his uh, mother. I still don't know what the significance of that accusation was supposed to be, but we do know the committee did not even bother to ask Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Livingstone if they even knew one another. The truth was an easy matter to discover. Instead, the committee relied solely on information it received from former FBI agent Scalabrini. The chairman took to the House floor to announce this allegation. Ironically, this announcement is the only evidence we have of any release of information from an FBI background file. On July 26, I wrote the chairman to request that Mr. Scalabrini appear before the committee for questioning. I've never received an answer to that request. The committee then moved on. Maybe Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Livingston did not know each other, went the tortured explanation, but Mr. Nussbaum may have thought that they knew each other. This committee has moved far afield of any objective purpose of this investigation. It has squandered its credibility by allowing itself to be used politically in an attempt to influence the November elections. The stakes in this political gamesmanship are too high when the integrity of this institution is used to up the ante. The committee continues to offer sensational charges without having even the most basic facts to support those charges. I urge my colleagues to defeat this report. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome this opportunity to comment on the release of the FBI background files in the interim committee report. Mr. Chairman, permit me to commend you for having performed this difficult inquiry in an extraordinarily fair and professional manner. Due to the seriousness of this violation of the privacy rights of our citizens and the possible misuse of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I do not look upon this committee's inquiry as any exercise in partisanship. The seriousness of this matter should be recognized by all and measures must be taken to make certain that it can never happen again. Moreover, the White House must be admonished and held accountable for its actions. Regrettably, some of our committee's actions may have inadvertently served to create perceived questionable and improper personal links between FBI Director Louis Free and former White House Security Director Craig Livingston. None, in fact, exist, and I regret any unfairness which may have occurred as to that point. It's inappropriate to create an appearance of improper links between FBI Director Free and Mr. Craig Livingston based solely upon innocuous and routine correspondence, such as asking for swearing-in photos. FBI Director Free, prior to taking office, indicated to President Clinton that he wanted to ensure and insisted upon, for the record, that the FBI remain above politics and be independent. Nothing in Director Free's actions while in office in any way is reflected on that important worthy goal. I cannot say the same for the current White House dealings with and respect for the FBI's vital independence and need to avoid entangling the FBI in politics. President Clinton and his White House staff haven't kept their part of that arrangement with Director Free and the FBI. President fully agreed to keep the FBI independent and out of politics. However, the record discloses the contrary. We need this strong, independent, and honest FBI director personified by Mr. Free. Let me make it very clear. I don't believe any director of the FBI should be above reproach, above criticism or scrutiny. However, the committee has found no evidence that Director Free has done anything to protect the President or Mrs. Clinton in this Filegate inquiry. 
nor has he linked improperly to Craig Livingston. On the contrary, he has been candid with regard to the White House abuse of these FBI background files. Mr. Chairman, let me make the following constructive recommendation, which should be part of our final report on the matter of the FBI General Counsel's inappropriate disclosures to the White House, covered extensively in the report before us at the present time. The FBI General Counsel's actions were unwise and reflected a basic lack of understanding on the need to protect sensitive information in regard to an ongoing inquiry by both the committee and the independent counsel conducting a federal grand jury inquiry at the time of his disclosure. Director Free did make a mistake in, filing such an, in filling such an important position as general counsel with someone from outside the FBI. We can readily remedy that situation in the future with the following recommendation, which I submit to my colleagues. All line or operational supervisory positions, including the general counsel in the FBI, shall hereafter be held only by FBI agent personnel. And any analysis of this sordid affair by the White House should clearly delineate the role of Director Free in the White House, as I've outlined. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield to me? I'd be pleased to yield to the chairman. Uh, the gentleman from California, who I'm sorry has left the room at the moment, uh, alleged that this was a political witch hunt that we were engaged on here. And I would just like to remind uh, the, my colleagues that this uh, whole investigation began over three years ago. It is uh, only because we are now in an election year because this administration has engaged in an effort to block us at every turn from getting the information we need to get a final report done. So the fact that we are now at this juncture uh, is not because this committee has been dilatory or has been deliberately trying to uh, make a political uh, game out of this. It's because we have been trying to get answers for low these many years, and the fact that we're now in election year uh, is not of our doing. And the chair would now recognize the gentle lady from New York State. Uh, does you un I? Who seeks recognition on the uh, honorary side? All right. Uh, who seeks chairman, recognition? Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fatah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, I would want to uh, briefly note that since this problem has emerged, uh, that there has been action taken on a number of fronts. The Democratic Party, uh, represented by our ranking members, introduced a bill uh, to change or to actually put into statute certain changes in the procedures that were initiated by the White House uh, as relates to handling of these background checks. Um, and the only thing that, that I would say is that so that the White House has taken action, the Democrats have offered to codify that action in statute, uh, and it's unfortunate that even though we may disagree on this report and its, um, and its motivations, that we were not able to, I think, fully deal with making sure that these types of problems would not emerge again in the future. So I do believe that the committee, um, that, that the reason why I think that it gives ammunition and credence to the fact that this has been politically motivated is that there hasn't seemed to be any sense of wanting to move to a point of resolution on making sure that there could never again be uh, any possibility of the misuse of this type of information in FBI files in the future. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I hope that uh, in the 105th Congress, uh, members on the other side of the aisle will join with us uh, so that we can move towards resolving uh, these types of matters, rather than continuing to investigate them forever. Uh, the gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Yes. The uh, gentleman from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Burton, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, it, it's troubling to me that uh, my colleagues in the minority uh, continue to say that this is uh, an erroneous report and should be defeated. There's so many problems that have been brought to light that I don't see how anyone who has studied this issue or these issues could believe that we shouldn't order this report passed by this, uh, this committee. First of all, let me just go into a few examples. I don't believe it was an error or ignorance that General Counsel Shapiro for the FBI four months before the book was published took Mr. Aldrich's book to the White House. Mr. Uh, Shapiro was an experienced 
attorney. He had worked with the uh, prosecutor, uh, now Lu FBI Director Louis Free in New York, and had been involved in some very uh, high-profile cases. He understood the law. He understood the ramifications of his actions. And nevertheless, he went down to the White House and took this book four months before it was published. Uh, so I don't believe it was an error or ignorance. I think it was a complicity by Mr. Shapiro. And Mr. Aldrich uh, said that in a conversation with Mr. Kennedy on the way to the airport, and I want to quote, uh, Mr. Kennedy asked uh, Mr. Aldrich what type of person should be in the position of director of the security office. Agent Aldrich answered that it should be somebody squeaky clean, meticulous, careful, discreet, mature, someone with a depth of understanding of security issues. Mr. Kennedy later told Aldrich, it doesn't matter anyway, it's a done deal. Hillary wants him, Livingstone, for that slot. Now this is a gentleman who had a background, if you go back to 1984, that was very clear that he was involved in dirty tricks as, as far back as the uh, 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 Gary Hart uh, campaign uh, involving uh, former Vice President Mondale. Uh, <coughs> so he wasn't squeaky clean. Nevertheless, uh, the White House chose to pick him for this job. Uh, Craig Livingstone uh, had over 700 files, we believe as many as 900 files, brought from the FBI to his office. Mr. Marcisa, his associate, took a lot of those files home. Can you imagine that? He took these files home and put them on, we believe, maybe personal computers, files that were supposed to be kept absolutely secret. We couldn't even get our files if we wanted them for up to three years, uh, even under the Freedom of Information Act. And yet, they made these files available to Mr. Livingstone, a man who'd been involved in dirty tricks, a man who Mr. Aldrich said shouldn't even be in that job, and Mr. Marcisa, his associate, who also was involved in these tricks in Pennsylvania in 1984, was picked as his assistant, his associate. Mr. Marcisa takes these files out of the White House to his home. I might remind my colleagues that Chuck Colson went to prison for one FBI file being made public, <laughs> and here we had almost 700 and 900 of them given to a man of, credi of questionable credibility, and his associate even took them out of the White House. So that's something that, you know, you, you just can't gloss over, something that we just can't uh, uh, forget. And then you, you read what Mr. Livingstone said in a memo, which I have before me. The memo is dated, well, it's not dated, but it's from uh, Mr. Livingstone to William Kennedy. And listen to what he says about these files. Quote, this will be our first glance at the background information of their employees. Now, what does that mean? You got 700 and 900 files that aren't even supposed to be there in the first place, and he's writing to Kennedy saying, this will be our first glance at the background information of their employees. It sounds like a little bit, a little bit like skullduggery to me, or a political witch hunt that they might use later on. That's another reason why this report must be published, must be made public, and, and the, uh, the, uh, must be passed by this committee. And then we go on, and you wonder about the FBI. The FBI, uh, when I talked to uh, Mr. Aldrich, Special Agent Aldrich and Mr. Scalambrini, I talked to both of them, they indicated that they were involved in more than just background checks at the White House. And yet this administration says no, that they were restricted to background checks. In the previous administration, they were involved in investigations into some corruption of some people that did some work at the White House and overcharged and some other things. And so they were very upset that they were circumvented by Mr. Livingstone and others, and they went to other people at the FBI. Now, why did they do that? Probably because, at least this is my deduction, because uh, they were afraid that Mr. Aldrich and Mr. Uh, Scullumbrini uh, could not be malleable. But they did, uh, here's, here's a note that was in this same memo from uh, Mr. Livingstone to Mr. Kennedy. Our FBI liaison is John Douglas Seward. According to him, he is available to perform favors. The FBI performing favors such as expediting a name check. Seward is separate from De Dennis Scalabrini and Gary Aldrich, who, is, who are assigned to the White House. Their office is located in 532 and gives their extension. But he says that uh, Mr. Seward uh, was available to do favors. And I could go on and on, Mr. Mr. Chairman, but I think the record speaks for itself. There are so many questions that are unanswered. One of the things that really bothers me is we have asked and subpoenaed these documents for months and months and months. And yet today, as we were taking a deposition, and I was involved in that with the staff who did a great job, I might add, 
Today, when we were taking the deposition just before we uh, took it, we got some more documents from the White House at 6.05 p.m. Now think about that. We subpoenaed these a long time ago. We're still getting documents, and I might add, one of the letters that we were reading in the hearing today, in the deposition, was incomplete. They only sent half of it. They didn't even send the complete letter, and we wonder why. The White House needs to come clean. It needs to give the American people and this committee the documents we requested and subpoenaed a long time ago, and this report should be passed by the committee and sent to the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman for his comments, and the chair would now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there, there is no doubt that the White House and, and the FBI showed uh, great insensitivity, mismanagement, and lack of uh, professional conduct in the way that they treated the, the background files of 400 former employees of the White House. It was wrong and a great violation of the personal privacy of these individuals. I, I had hoped uh, that the committee's report would focus on ways to ensure the privacy of, of those who must uh, submit to FBI security checks in order to, to gain uh, clearance to work at the White House. Uh, these uh, hearings clearly demonstrated the need for greater controls, such as those implemented recently by the FBI and the White House. Sensitive information should not be uh, provided to anyone without a verified need. And individuals who have submitted to background checks are entitled to know that the information collected will be totally confidential. If the majority had focused on ways to improve security and to ensure the privacy of sensitive information, the American people would have been uh, well served by these hearings. Uh, regrettably, the, the majority is more interested uh, in scoring uh, political points than in finding the truth over and over again when witnesses conflict the report chooses to view the administration's witnesses as making up lies in some instances stretching the truth in order to condemn the majority repeats the allegation that the Secret Service could not have produced the lists that Anthony Marciso worked from. But that would mean that Nancy Gemmell, a career employee, was not telling the truth when she told Congressman Schiff that she thought the list came from the Secret Service. And that would mean that Lisa Wetzel was wrong when she stated that the Secret Service was known to generate lists that included names of people who were no longer had active passes. After more than 30 hours of hearings, we have not heard any testimony or seen any evidence of any unethical or criminal behavior by anyone in the White House. So with no smoking gun that is documented, the majority has looked around for a scapegoat, and they have found FBI General Counsel Howard Shapiro. Howard Shapiro is a career enforcement officer who was first hired under a Republican administration. He is accused of revealing information to the White House before the majority had a chance to reveal it to the press. The majority appears to believe that a soon-to-be-published manuscript containing numerous breaches of White House security is so confidential that it is improper for the FBI to share it with the White House. FBI files are certainly confidential, but a disgruntled employee's effort to cash in on his access to the White House is not. The FBI's first obligation must be to the safety and security of the President and the White House. If the FBI has reason to know that White House security measures are going to be revealed to the general public, the FBI has an obligation to notify the White House. There will always be unanswered questions with a hearing of this kind. 
That is why the independent prosecutor, Kenneth Starr, has been asked to look into this matter. If there was any criminal act or, wrong or wrongdoing, he and his staff are really in the best position to discover it. If this committee really wanted to improve the way confidential FBI files were handled, it would act to pass the bill introduced by our ranking member, Curtis Collins, H.R. 3785. As was stated earlier, the FBI came out with a series of proposals to improve the security of files, the security of individuals. The purpose of this committee is to reform government, to act to improve it. And I would really, uh, really suggest, Mr. Chairman, that if you were serious about truly improving government, and, and the matter before us, we would have acted in a serious way uh, to review, to have hearings on this legislation, and to put the force of law behind those recommendations. I yield back the balance of Kennedy my time. yields back the balance of his time. I would note that uh, I'm told we're going to have a series of four votes in about another 10 minutes. And each one will be a 15-minute vote, which will be, in other words, we're going to be voting for an hour, as I understand it. I am very sensitive to the fact that I don't want to impede on anybody's opportunity to discuss this report. But I would urge you, if at all possible, to be as brief, as succinct, as terse, as pithy as you can be uh, in your remarks. And I would now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hastert. Well, I thank the chairman. You know, when I grew up out in the country, in Illinois, uh, there was an old saying that, you know, he never looked at the horse as much as he looked at the guy who was trying to trade the horse. And, you know, I guess that goes back to the old saw of wisdom. If you trust people, if they're worthy of your trust, they do try to do the right things, and then that product that they push is, is, a, is a valuable product. I guess what's happening here is that you can write all kinds of laws, and you can write all kinds of rules, and you can all... Uh, write all types of regulations. But unless the people who are supposed to hold those regulations and uh, work the system uh, to its best ability aren't credible, if they try to circumvent the, the system, if they try to corrupt the FBI, if they try to uh, slant the Secret Service, if they try to do these things for their own political advantage, then I guess you can't even set all types of rules and, and, and laws. One of the things that this committee has is the right to do oversight. And I certainly commend the chairman for doing a very, very credible job of that over the last few years. Now we have a report. The report's taken from the best information that this committee could gather. And it's time to vote it yes or vote it no, whatever your uh, disposition is. And let's go get on with it. And I uh, would yield the remainder of my time to the gentlewoman from Maryland. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And Mr. Chairman, I also want to commend you on your outstanding work in piecing together the events surrounding the hundreds of FBI files improperly requested by the White House. I'd like to reiterate that this investigation did begin in July of 1993 when you first sent a letter regarding the circumstances surrounding the firings of seven White House Travel Office employees. The document that triggered the release of the FBI file list was discovered in the 1,000 pages that were produced by the White House the day that the House was scheduled to vote on the contempt resolution. And among those 1,000 pages was a memo from former White House counsel Bernard Nussbaum to the FBI requesting confidential FBI reports on Billy Dale, who had been fired seven months before. We now know that Billy Dale's file was among the hundreds of confidential FBI files requested by the White House, and that these files belonged primarily to former Reagan and Bush appointees, some of whom had not worked in the White House for over a decade. And although many questions remain unanswered, this interim report is an important summary of what we know to date. Um, I have many other comments that I'd like to submit for the record, but um, in, the interest of, um, in the interest of time, an egregious breach of privacy has occurred. 
More than 700 citizens, many of whom are my constituents, have been victimized by the White House. This report is an important step en route to discovering the truth. And I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Does any other member seek recognition to speak uh, on the report? If not, the vote now occurs on the, uh, on the report entitled Investigation to the White House and Department of Justice on Security of FBI Background Investigation Files to the Full House. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes do have it. And the report <laughs> will be reported favorably to the full house. And with that, uh, the gentlelady from uh, Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I said earlier, both of us are leaving this body and the control of this House and the committee are in doubt, so my final remarks are addressed to whomever assumes control of this committee. As I also said in my opening statement, I truly regret the loss of partisanship in this committee. Now, this is not a knee-jerk reaction, as some have called it. Uh, I have served in this committee since June the 7th of 1973, and I served in the majority for all but two of my nearly 24 years. And many of those years were spent as chairwoman of a subcommittee. In all of those years, I never once issued a report that did not have bipartisan backing. I never requested a subpoena without bipartisan support. And while I was always willing to take on a political fight, I am proud that legislation I brought to the floor as chairwoman of the subcommittees on this committee, as well as on the Commerce Committee, always enjoyed bipartisan support. So I would urge the next chairman of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee to think along the same lines. A partisan report is just that. It's one that has considered only the allegations and accusations of one party against the other. On the other hand, a bipartisan report is considered to make findings and draw conclusions. As such, it carries far more weight, even though the staff may have to tone down the rhetoric and drop unsubstantiated, irrelevant findings. Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, for quietness so I can hear myself the, think. The gentleman is absolutely correct. Uh, may I just interrupt the for one moment? The committee is not in order. Well, may I just uh, interject for one moment while we still have some people here to make one announcement, which is that uh, it is my intention to schedule a photograph for the uh, full committee on Friday at 1030 in this room. So just for everybody's, uh, uh, everybody's advised that uh, we will end on a note of comedy and uh, Well, as soon as I get through my statement. And now I would yield back. <laughs> To the gentlelady. In yesterday's roll call, Norman Ornstein wrote that the committee devoted, quote, its attention to various and sundry whitewater investigations instead of looking at the organization and function of government and wasted much time on the battle over lobbying by nonprofit organizations, yeah. end quote. Now I think this statement accurately Come summarizes on. the work of this committee. Yeah. We have found that during the past two years we could work together on legislation, such as procurement, procure, procurement reform and the fine work of many of our subcommittee, particularly the D.C. subcommittee, the government management subcommittee, and the human resources subcommittee. Those subcommittees and others also contributed many useful bipartisan reports. So let us recognize that it can still be done. So while we can criticize the unprecedented partisan investigations of this committee, we also have to acknowledge and note that um, it's possible to take a different road. And so we certainly hope that our successors have the wisdom to find uh, a way to be bipartisan in all of these. Now, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Waxman is not here, but I had actually brought along a uh, gavel, which I did not have a chance to use in chairing this committee, because you are, of course, the chair now. And so I hold this, this, this up so that when Mr. Waxman does become chair of this committee next year, he will have a gavel already in place and yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Mr. Chairman? So we're going Mr. to use that gavel on, Mr. on Chairman. me. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Chairman? Gentleman from Indiana. I, I just want to say as a freshman, but somebody who served as a, a, a Republican staff director when the Democrats were in the majority and in the Senate, that I want to compliment you on the way you handled the committee and I believe a number of our subcommittees, and Mr. Shea's subcommittee, Mr. Zell's subcommittee, we proceeded to do a lot of different things, ranging from the drug issue to Medicare, Medicaid, many things beyond just what's been in the media. A lot of times you don't get coverage on that. I believe you've been even-handed in very difficult circumstances, and I feel it's a privilege to have served with you. And I also think, in the end, the real proof is this. On both of the reports, 
The Democrats didn't vote no because they didn't want to go on record in an interim report. Well, I thank the gentleman very much for his comments. And uh, let me just say in closing, this does conclude the business of the committee. I want to express uh, my great appreciation to the members of the staff on both sides of the aisle who have done a superb job. We've worked them too hard and they've come through magnificently. So to the entire staff uh, on all the, the full committee and, and the subcommittee, we've done a will great the gentleman job. Yield? Mr. Clint. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, I'm sorry. Will the gentleman yield? Oh, whoever it is, I'll it's yield. Me. Yeah. Oh, the gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, as a fellow Pennsylvanian and uh, on occasion that we have disagreed philosophically, sometimes politically. Uh, I would be remiss if tonight, as we close uh, this committee hearing, I, I didn't acquaint my colleagues on the uh, majority side and the minority side that we in Pennsylvania are still very pleased that uh, Pennsylvania had a congressman like William Klinger. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to thank you for serving. I know that uh, although we've had these disagreements, particularly contentious this last session. Uh, we know where your heart is, and uh, you'll continue to serve well your constituents and the state of Pennsylvania. So congratulations, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Nice. Chairman. Uh, General Lee, yeah. I, I, just, I just want to add to that and say that we're going to miss you here in Congress, Mr. Klinger, and we're going to miss Ms. Collins. Also, I think both of you have served your constituents and our country very well. We wish you well. Thank you very much. I know Ms. Collins and I both uh, wish you all luck in the forthcoming election. Uh, however that may turn out, we wish you all the best of luck in the election and we'll be uh, watching with great interest. And with that, the committee stands adjourned.